In our previous video, we had derived what the bending stress would be at any point uh, across a cross section. Um, and so and we came, you know, after sort of an hour's worth of derivation and some free body diagrams, we arrived at what's actually a relatively simple equation where uh, the stress due to bending um, at you know any distance away from the neutral axis is simply going to be the applied moment at a given section, the distance uh, away from the neutral axis y divided by the second moment of area, also known as the moment of inertia. So this simple equation of bending stress equals my over i um, will be you know one of the sort of workhorses of our structural mechanics. Um, toolbox. And so, you know, we can use this again and again for really any type of section uh, to determine what our bending stress is as long as the section remains elastic. And so what we're going to do today is just work through a few examples and show uh, how to apply this. And, and hopefully you'll see that it, um, the application of it is quite straightforward and it's simply sort of building on what we've already learned. So with that, I'll start with an example. So the example that I have here uh, it's just a you know small two meter long simply supported beam, um, and it has a cross section where it's just a rectangular cross section that's 50 millimeters wide, 200 millimeters deep, and has a single point load of 10 kilonewtons on it. And so, uh, what's being asked of us is to determine what the distribution of stress is um, across the the section at the point of maximum moment. So, if we have a problem like this, the first thing we need to do is sort of approach um, you know, where, where we would need to get our, our demands are, what our maximum moment is. And the first step in any problem like that is to draw a free body diagram. So let's draw a free body diagram of this beam. And it has this applied load of uh, 10 kilonewtons. And it will have a reaction. Uh, we're going to be a little bit lazy here uh, because it is a symmetric beam, which is simply supported. Uh, we could work through the statics, but we do kind of know that, uh, you know, both reactions are going to be uh, equal to 5 kilonewtons. And we got 1 meter, 1 meter. And so that's our free body diagram. Um, again, if we want to determine uh, what our demands are, it's also useful to draw shear and bending moment diagrams. Since we need to determine uh, point of maximum moment, it's good to have a bending moment diagram to see, well, what is our distribution of that? So... Uh, we'll start with just our shear force diagram, and its units will be in kilonewtons, and uh, positive will be the little block is wanting to spin clockwise, so our shear force diagram, uh, we're going to come up, 5 kilonewtons, constant shear, down by our 10 kilonewton load, and then again up another 5 kilonewtons, so this is 5 kilonewtons, 5 kilonewtons. Uh, shear on this side is up on the left, down on the right, so it's spinning clockwise. And on the other end, we are obviously opposite. And then our bending moment diagram, uh, we're going to say that the positive bending moment, uh, internal bending moment, is one that puts the top into compression, and we will be in kilonewton meters. And because we have a constant uh, shear force diagram, the uh, magnitude of the shear force diagram will be the slope of our bending moment diagram. Again, should just be review at this stage, but uh, constant slope. So we'll have a linear bending moment, then we switch signs, and we'll come back the other direction. And these are happy beams getting bent, um, you know, simply like this. Um, we also know that, you know, f the area of the shear force diagram uh, will equal the magnitude of the bending moment diagram, so uh, we can work out uh, what our maximum moment is. Uh, also, there's some of these simple cases where, uh, frankly, I just have the, you know, what the maximum moment is, that formula memorized, um, which just comes from statics, effectively, but I know that the maximum moment is simply going to be P times the length of the beam over 4, and that's going to be equal to 10 kilonewtons times 2 meters over 4. And if we work out the arithmetic there, uh, we get 5.0 kilonewton meters. Alright, so that's pretty straightforward. Now, 
that gives us our m, uh, our distance y. So we know this is for a rectangle. We know the centroid is going to be right in the middle. So we know uh, any distance y will simply just be away from there. We have y. The only thing we're left to find in order to get bending stress is the moment of inertia, uh, i. So i for a rectangle is simply going to be equal to 1 over 12 times the width times the height cubed. So if we work all of that out, ix equals 3.33 times 10 to the seventh millimeters to the fourth. And again, at this stage, you know, after we've done all the work on parallel axis theorem, uh, this should be pretty straightforward to apply. So now all we have to do is we, we kind of have all the all the pieces for this. We've got what the maximum moment is. Uh, we know our section geometry, so we can determine why. We know our moment of inertia. Um, now we just have to work out, well, what the distribution of this stress is across the section. So uh, with that, we'll just draw a little diagram. Um, and again, we'll go through this actually kind of slow and step by step since it's the first time that we're doing it just to make sure that everything is nice and clear. So if we do that, uh, again, let's just draw our little cross section here. And we know that the centroid is right in the middle. Um, and we've got our dimensions of 100 millimeters, 100 millimeters, and 50 millimeters. Um, our neutral axis is right at our centroid. And our distance y, um, based upon how we derived our uh, formula my over i, our distance y is simply going down from our neutral axis. All right, and then I guess the only other thing to sort of note is just sort of what our sign conventions are, where um, based upon my over i and how we did our derivation, um, it means that if we have positive stress, uh, that is going to be in tension. And if we have a negative stress, uh, that's going to signify, signify compression. All right, so again, um, Maybe, again, because of the first time we do this, it's probably useful to write out a few other sort of you know basic assumptions that we have. You don't have to do this every time. Um, in fact, I'd be sort of surprised if you did. But because this is the first time we're working with this equation, um, we've just derived it. It is worth a sort of spelling out, you know, what we're, we're effectively assuming. Um, and that is going to be that uh, the member... is subjected to pure bending. Bending. And what this means is that plane sections remain planed. And this is, you know, again, the key assumption that we're using, which enables us to use this bending stress equals my over i, is that, you know, as we bend this, the cross sections just rotate. They they don't deform in in shear. They're not they're not moving, you know, into S shapes. They stay straight. They simply rotate about a point. Um, and so, you know, what this plane sections remain planed gives us is the fact that we have a linear strain profile
And because we um, have a linear strain profile and we're also assuming elastic behavior of the member so that it's not going to undergo any permanent deformation, you know, just like the foam beam, if I bend it, it just snaps back to uh, the original um, geometry. It's not going to have any permanent deformation. You know, like if you take a paper clip and you bend a paper clip um, back on itself, it, it won't spring back. So that's called plastic deformation. That's not what we're working with here. So because we have elastic behavior, Um, and that means that Hooke's law um, applies. So our bending stress is simply going to be uh, the Young's modulus times the strain. And if we have a linear strain profile, we have a linear stress distribution. Now, all of these assumptions are baked into this equation, stress equals my over i. But like I said, this is the first time we've ever used it, so it's worth writing this down. And it's this linear stress distribution, which is really important. And really all that means is that we just have to work out, um, you know, if we've got this prismatic section like this, where the cross section uh, doesn't change with it, so its width doesn't change with its distance away from the neutral axis, we really only need to find out what the stress is at the top and the stresses at the bottom. Um, also, that's going to be where we're going to have our maximum uh, bending moment because that's going to be, you know, where to make this bigger, we need to make Y bigger. Well, Y gets biggest the further away you go from the neutral axis. And if you start at Y is zero, our stress will be zero by definition uh, by the neutral axis because the neutral axis doesn't deform. All right, so and now that we've, we've sort of gone through that um, and, and you know, probably a bit more detail than you had expected, um, let's just actually work through and work out what the stress distribution is. And so what we'll start with is just find out the stress at the bottom of the section. So stress at the bottom is going to be M times Y over I. And that is going to equal 5.0 kilonewton meters times our distance to the bottom is a positive Y of 100 millimeters. Um, let's get this into uh, units that we can work with, which will be you know a thousand newtons per kilonewton multiplied by a thousand millimeters per meter and we're getting into newtons and meters because we want to get to stress um, and MPA is just newtons per millimeter squared and that's going to be over 3.33 times 10 to the seventh millimeters to the fourth um, let's do a little bit of um, you know, organization here and sort of re reshuffling of stuff And we will end up with, if we work all of this out, 15 newtons per millimeter squared. And um, so that's sigma bottom. And 15 newtons per millimeter squared is the same as uh, 15 megapascals. So uh, sigma bottom equals uh, 15 MPA. Cool, now we have a stress. Um, let's work out what our stress is at the top of the section. Um, so our distance Y will be going a negative 100 millimeters. So uh, sigma top. Uh, again, the stress at the top is still going to be uh, the applied moment times the distance away from the neutral axis uh, divided by the moment of inertia. So the moment hasn't changed, still five kilonewtons per meter. And now our distance is going to be, as I said, uh, negative 100 millimeters uh, based upon our coordinate system here. And with this coordinate system, that means if we have a negative stress, we are in compression, which should make sense because, you know, we know that the top of the beam is in compression, the bottom is in tension based upon this type of bending. 
Uh, again, we'll just sort of work out our units to get those squared away. We'll have um, 100, oh sorry, 1,000 kilonewtons per, not newtons per kilonewton, and multiply by 1,000 millimeters per meter, and divide everything by I, which is 3.33 times 10 to the 7th millimeters to the 4th. Uh, again, work all of this out. The only difference is we have a negative 100 instead of a positive 100, so we get um, the stress at the top is going to be negative 15 newtons per millimeter squared. Top equals negative 15 MPA. All right, so that's, uh, you know, again, this is just simply the same as saying sigma top equals 15 MPA in compression. Now, just a quick aside on um, sign convention. Now, um, we've laid it out here mathematically and, and explicitly said that, you know, if you got a negative stress, you're going to have, uh, you'll be in compression. And really, this is how uh, computer programs are, are written. We just give them uh, really simple rules. However, you know, most structural engineers will simply think of Y as some, you know, absolute value. They won't bother with a negative 100. They'll just type in 100. And then they know from context that, you know, because the beam is bending on the top, uh, uh, bending, it's going to be in compression on the top. So that'll be a compressive uh, for so you know as you go through this class know that I'm not going to be a stickler on making sure Oh, you had a negative 100 there versus a positive 100 You can use this fact if you're ever confused or if you're ever trying to write a piece of software which calculates this for you um, But just know that for how a uh, structural engineer would uh, utilize this They're they're just going to simply say ah, It's 15 MPA in compression and use the fact that they know what their structure is doing uh, in order to get them there all right, so we've worked out what the stress is at the top and the bottom. We've worked out the fact we have a linear stress distribution. Uh, now we just have to finally answer the question is what's the distribution of stress uh, at the point of maximum moment? So um, if we draw our stress distribution down here, so I'll draw what the stress distribution is and then we'll show it in sort of 3D to get let you um, kind of uh, work this out and, and have a visualization. Uh, it's simply going to be 15 MPA at the top, 15 MPA at the bottom, and a straight line connecting the two, and that straight line goes to zero at the neutral axis, which is at the centroid. And we'd have the top in compression and the bottom in tension. So simple as that, you know, just a, and this is, this is because, you know, we, um, we understand that plane sections are going to remain plane. So we've got a linear strain profile. So we've got a linear stress distribution. And so we really just have to find out what that stress distribution is at, at two points of interest. So what is this sort of stress distribution diagram? What does that represent in three dimensions? So if I draw the section for you. And uh, what it means, so we have, you know, we know at the top there's a stress of fifteen MPA in compression, and we know there's a stress of fifteen MPA in tension. And that right at the middle, these come down to zero at the neutral axis. And so you can think of, you know, the stress distribution is really showing, um, you know, a cross section of what the stress looks like. And that's because um, the stress is going to be constant across the width of the cross section. 
So across this width of 50 millimeters, we know that we're not going to have any change in our stress. Our stress only changes with respect to the neutral axis, which is really all that this is saying. So if y is, on, is the only thing which is uh, cross-section related, which changes, which is just the depth uh, across the neutral axis, um, then yeah, it, it's where it means that across the width of the member, we're not going to have any difference there. And so really what that's saying is we've got some compression, we've got some stress, and that's because, you know, we've got some um, moment, which this is really um, sort of, you know, reacting against, where you get some moment, it's going to be balanced by a compression and a tension force, uh, equivalent tension and compression force there. So, and then again, we'll just sort of come out here, draw our dimensions. And, and that's it. So uh, maybe a bit of a long-winded discussion on uh, how to get to bending stress, because you can see the calculations were, were relatively straightforward. And um, But as I said, it's the first time we did it. I wanted to go slow and go through you know all of the painful little details, and so we can understand the subtleties, understand the assumptions that we're using, um, and, and and we can use this effectively. So uh, hopefully what you find is that it was actually pretty straightforward to apply, uh, this bending stress, uh, my over i, and what we'll do in some subsequent videos is just run through uh, a number of uh, different uh, examples for that. So with that, thanks for watching.